Welcome to Greenable Woodbridge. I am your host, Carolyn Ehrlich. The topic for today is the green economy. And basically what the green economy talks about is um, we educate, we teach people about being more sustainable, which would create a demand. And then once you create a demand, you create a supply. And then needing that supply creates jobs. So for instance, if we're teaching people about building greener buildings, there suddenly becomes a demand for green materials, for actually knowing how to build those green materials, which then creates jobs. Um, and we are very fortunate to have as our guest today one of the leaders in um, the green economy, because you do exactly that, you work with green supplies, and um, you create green jobs. You have green jobs and you train people for green jobs. All, that's all what we're talking about, what we would like to see in the growing green economy. So today's guest is Richard Tolson, who is the director of the New Jersey Administrative Council. And um, I'm going to let you explain what your council is, who it represents, who's a part of it, and um, get us started today. So welcome, well, Richard. Thank you, and uh, good morning. Um, again, I am the director for the Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers uh, Administrative District Council for the state of New Jersey. Uh, we represent all the trial trades, the stone setters, the bricklayers, the cement finishers, plasters, caulkers, restoration workers um, throughout the state. Um, we, along with our International Masonry Institute, um, recruit, train, um, both the apprentices and journey workers in the crafts. We represent 5,000 members throughout the state um, that have all been trained and as we refer to them as the best hands in the business. Absolutely. Um, our, as you mentioned, our products lend themselves and have for centuries to um, greenable, green building um, and energy efficiency, uh, masonry and terracotta, um, stone of course and, and concrete. So um, when it became um, part of uh, the dialogue in the construction industry of LEED certification and green building. Of course, our products are already there, and it's been a matter now of getting our membership uh, up to speed with that and buying into it, as well as our contractors. Mm -hmm. um, so we have programs in place um, to train and educate uh, both the uh, membership, the rank and file membership, and the employers as well. So you were actually doing this before LEEDs came into place? We were do, have been doing the training. We've been doing the training for years. Our international is the oldest continuous uh, building trades international union in the country. Right. This past September, we celebrated our 150th anniversary um, yeah. in Baltimore, one of the founding cities along with Philadelphia. Um, so our training um, and professionalism is very old and very dear and very right. uh, important to us. So um, yeah, we were already had the materials. Mm -hmm. um, it was a matter of adapting to a, a degree um, to the lead uh, qualifications and the certifications and, and the green building as architects and the design community was right. presented to us. So just for our viewers who aren't familiar with lead, very briefly what that is is a set of standards for new construction and I think rehab too, right? It, it to applies to build both. build greener, more sustainable buildings. So, correct? It, it, correct. It, it's more difficult and, and more um, challenging in renovations and mm -hmm. bringing older buildings up to, uh, to lead be. standards. Mm -hmm. But in new construction, absolutely, it's the it's the standard and as they say, the gold standard. And mm -hmm. they use we use colors to identify all levels of both good and bad things in our country anymore. Right. Um, but um, the lead standard um, has raised awareness throughout the community from owners and mm -hmm. developers to the contractors, to the rank and file members, and it's given us an opportunity to raise the professionalism of internally of our own membership and make right. them more aware, give them the skills and train them in the skills that they need, um, that these jobs once completed can meet the standards as required by LEED. You've mentioned um, training a few times already. Can you talk to us a little bit about your training programs, your apprenticeship? 
scholarship program? Of course, I'd be happy to. We, we believe in education is a term that wasn't always synonymous with the building trades unions, mm -hmm. um, but has become more and more important over time. Um, in education, it's a it's a four year apprenticeship, similar to a college degree. Four um, years. Yeah, it's four oh, years. There's twelve like weeks. That. We have here in New Jersey, we have two training centers. We have one in Bordentown, mm -hmm. and we're fortunate we also have one in Fairfield as well. Mm -hmm. The International Mason Institute has the John Flynn Center, our national training center um, in Bowie, Maryland, um, that does training for people from all over the country in Canada. Um, but our training centers here, uh, the young men and women go in for 12 weeks, five days a week for hands-on training, um, and then serve a four-year apprenticeship in the field for our employers. Um, we, in addition to that, we have upgrade and cross-craft training for our journey workers, those that have already served their apprenticeships and graduated from that and gone on and had careers. Um, we're in the process of developing a certification process for our members um, that includes a lot of the lead and green um, certifications as well as flashings that are important to the owners to make sure their buildings don't leak, um, grout certifications and different other things that are important to our industry to make sure that our products stay on a job, uh, that they're installed properly. So um, we're doing a lot with training. It's the backbone of our organization. It's Obviously. what separates us from our competition, um, we believe, is the training that we offer. It's one of the things that separates us. So, so let's say I wanted to um, change my field, although it would be pretty bad for me to go in construction because I hard, can hardly use a hammer, but um, let's say somebody yeah. like me wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And how would I go about this? Well, our union halls are also located in the same buildings as our uh, Bordentown facilities. Mm -hmm. um, we have a website um, that walks people through it. We have advanced our technological skills to keep up with all of the industries of today. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a matter of coming in. It, as an apprentice, uh, we have year-round ongoing um, mm -hmm. interview applications and interview process. Um, the standards um, to even be considered is you have to possess a valid driver's license. Uh, you have to have a high school uh, diploma or a GED, and you have to pass a drug test. Um, it is very important anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and um, once that is done, an interview is conducted uh, with some of our instructors that we have, our statewide coordinator and our local instructors. Um, and then they come into the apprentice program that I described earlier. Right. Uh, for those that have experience and be, are beyond an apprentice level, journey workers that mm -hmm. aren't unionized, um, they have to pass the proficiency test, the hands-on proficiency test um, during the course of a three-hour period in our training center. Mm -hmm. They're evaluated and scored on that, and if they, if they score above a certain level, uh, they're admitted as a journey worker into the union. That is great. Yep, it's a good it's process. A it, it works yes. well. It's been refined over the years and improved mm -hmm. over the years, and uh, um, we've been able to, uh, you know, attract a higher level of right. craft worker, which is what we need because. You know, we're putting up buildings. The building <laughs> yeah. we're sitting in, our schools, our places of worship, you know, our municipal buildings, everything else, people need to be safe in those buildings. Mm -hmm. And in order for them to feel safe, they have to be constructed properly. Exactly, and, and with all this training and, and your principles we've, and your strategies. We've, we feel that we you do it better them. than anybody. Yep. I, I know you sent over a little uh, a white paper for me to help me be more familiar before we sat down to talk. And one of the things that really impressed me in that paper was you mentioned the pride and the attachment that you know, the construction teams have when they build something. Can you talk about that a little more? Well, that goes goes back to our, our beginning in 1865. And if I could, though, for a minute, I have to clarify one thing. The white paper you received actually came um, from one of our staff people at the International Mason Institute, Maria Viteri. Oh, well, thank Maria. Um, yeah, she's it was phenomenal. Great. <laughs> we have, through the IMI, the International Mason Institute, we have um, professionals, both architects, engineers, marketing people. Um, mm -hmm college degrees that are working on uh, marketing, research and development, uh, promotion and training as well as a part of IMI, but that came from Marie. I can't take credit for that. <laughs> She's the technical person. Um, but as far as the pride, again, it goes back to 1865. And it's in preparation for this, just this morning I was thinking about the, um, showing a video to our members 
our journey workers used to go to work in shirts and ties and wear full coveralls um, to keep and would take them off at lunch and at break and certainly at the end of the day um, and they were dressed very professional and their workmanship showed it and our mm -hmm. cities especially in the Northeast um, are littered with you know testimony to their craftsmanship um, and we've always had the ability to take our children and grandchildren and go past and say, hey, I, I worked on that building right. and it's still there. Um, and, you know, we've recognized some of our craftsmanship over the years through different award programs that we give out. Um, but we, that is a part of our labor history in our training uh, that we try and instill in our new members as well is that, um, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants that built this industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to maintain that level of pride that they always had right. um, and pass it on to the next generation as well. Truly really understandable why if you have work to be done, you want to hire somebody from the union well, to do we, it. Well, we believe in that. We yep. believe in that. And so our training isn't just in the craft work itself. It's also in the safety mm -hmm. um, and the requ safety requirements on jobs. And we want to make sure and ensure um, that when our members go to work in the morning, that they come home in the same condition that they left that morning and come home to their family. So that, that's such an important point. It's huge. It's yeah. huge because it doesn't always happen. Right. Uh, I lost friends and members mm -hmm. uh, on the collapse at the Tropicana in Atlantic City and there's countless unfortunately countless examples up and down the state and throughout the country that uh, where safety is so critical mm -hmm. um, to the job and certainly to the lives of the people performing the work on that job. I, I actually see that when I wear my other hat as director of redevelopment in this town. Is it a when, hard hat? Uh, yes, I do wear <laughs> good, a hard hat good. and, and work through go. everything. But when, but the interesting thing is, is when I go on the sites that has union labor on it, they are very strict about the safety, and I have to wear the hard hat, and I have to wear the shoes with the metal tips, and you know the the fluorescent um, jacket, Jackets, and, yeah. and all of that, safety, yeah. and safety and signs, and they're doing safety training all over the place. And when I go, I know you're not happy, but we do have a couple of projects that are non-union. And when I go to those sites, oh, don't worry about it. It's okay. And I go, no, it's I'm a whole different it. it's condition, very different. yeah. Yes. And you know, there was a time. Um, cynically that we believe that employers were doing that or owners were doing requiring that and right. the general contractors were for their own good because it gave them a benefit on our insurance but I think the labor management cooperation that we certainly have here in New Jersey mm -hmm. um, with our general contractors and our subcontractors and our rank and file is that now we need to make the job safe it makes for a more efficient job it, members morale is better um, they work more freely uh, when they know that their job is safe and that yeah. you know they're going to be able to go home at the end of the day absolutely so um as I'm learning more about sustainability and construction, one of the things that I'm constantly reading is that you can put all these sustainable things into a building, but the, the core, the most important thing is the building envelope. And that's what your people do. They build that building envelope. Do, can you talk about what it is that makes that greener? Well, it's the materials again, right. and it, but it you know continues into the installation of those materials. But um, it, we've seen a change in the industry. For years, it was a masonry interior wall with a masonry exterior wall with a cavity for ventilation and mm -hmm. moisture and all those different things. Um, and over the years, through the efforts of other industries, you know you're seeing metal studs and sheetrock on interior walls. Um, and uh, all these are good products, and when they're union installed, they're installed properly. Um, mm -hmm. But I think over the course of time, the life cycle of a building is much higher. The efficiency of a building is much better um, when it's a full masonry envelope um, of the building, both the interior and the exterior walls, right. um, for flow of, of energy, um, for the containment of energy in the building, um, and for safety, unfortunately, as we've seen too often in, in our schools, um, that, you know, the masonry building when I was growing up, and I know you're much younger than I am. <laughs> I don't think so. So <laughs> when I was growing up, our schools were the places for evacuations, for safety yes. shelters, and certainly in the generations before us, it, it was right. the case. Um, 
I don't know if we would have that anymore if the schools aren't built completely out of masonry. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they would be the places we would go. So um, the building envelope is very important. It's something we spend a lot of time on um, in marketing and showing the differences. Um, mm -hmm. It's not just about your upfront costs. It's about your life cycle cost of maintenance, mm -hmm. your energy savings over the course of the lifetime of that building, um, and the safety elements that we're able to bring. That's terrific. Um, you had mentioned a green train a trainer program. What is that? Again, that is uh, an initiative of our, of our International Masonry Institute. Um, we have certified people that can do this training at our National Training Center in Bowie. Um, what we do is take our instructors locally, and not just here in New Jersey, but throughout the country and Canada, um, and they're sent um, to Bowie to get that training and get that trainer certification so they can come back to their home locals um, here in New Jersey, in our case, and be able to train up. Others. Right. So it's, you know, going, taking the lead professor and developing other professors that to go terrific. and teach the programs locally so you don't have the cost involved of sending them all to one place that we can do it here. It's certainly easier for our members. It avoids being away from home and things like that. So it's just branching out who can teach and who can be certified and qualified. Um, to teach. We don't want to just give a certification and you got a card in your pocket and it says, and I'll be honest, I couldn't teach it. Uh -huh. And I have a lot of years of experience here, but I'm not certified to teach that class, nor would I promote myself that I could. Right. Um, but there are those that can. And it makes us be able to deliver it on a broader basis um, to all of our members. So if somebody wanted to hire um, the union to do their construction, how do they go about doing it? Well, what we've always said is call to hall. <laughs> it's basically that simple. We work under a collective bargaining agreement mm -hmm. um, that sets out uh, a mentor of mine from years ago, Joe Dorenzo, used to say, our business is really easy. We write it down. It's very clear. Uh -huh. And we both sign it and uh -huh. agree to it. Right. Um, so our collective bargaining agreement is the Bible of our industry. It spells out our working conditions in regards to wages, fringe benefits, um, conditions on the job, hours of work, overtime, things like that. So for an employer um, who isn't uh, currently signatory with us, it's a matter of meeting with us, uh, myself, um, any one of the representatives throughout the state, um, reading through the collective bargaining agreement, coming to an understanding. Um, asking questions back and forth and determining that it's in the best interest of their business um, to work alongside with us. And um, one of the things that I do as a redevelopment agency is I encourage our construction people to do a PLA. And, and we go to your friend Kevin Duncan, mm -hmm. who negotiates them on behalf of all the trades. All the building trades. All the yeah. building trades. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because that's important. You know, first, I'm going to go back to Kevin Duncan, who yeah. just uh, Tuesday was unopposed as president of the Middlesex County Building Trades oh, great. again. So Good. I get to keep congratulations with him. to him, and yes. you to have the pleasure of continuing to work with them. Uh, PLAs, as you said, are project labor agreements. Um, that an owner enters into um, with his or her general contractor um, and the local building trades councils. Um, it guarantees harmony on the job. Um, and it's for all the different 15 different building trades um, in any geographic area um, that exists throughout the state. Um, and it guarantees that we're going to supply the job. and. Uh, Statistics will show that we'll bring a job in either on time or early, and certainly yeah. on budget or less expensive than anticipated. And uh, a good quality job with uh, safety record stands on its own. Um, it, it does allow um, in our project labor agreements, it's not discriminatory. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to be a signatory union contractor to work under a project labor agreement. There are um, some standards of percentages mm -hmm. um, that have to come from the local union hiring halls right. or referral halls. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't discriminate or prohibit anyone from participating in a public project that has a uh, project labor agreement on it. And not everybody understands that. Mm -hmm. They think it's an exclusive union mm -hmm. uh, document, That's and important. it's not necessarily that. So we have um, Arizona Ice-T should be negotiating one with you very shortly, and um, 
That should be the first of a lot to follow. Uh, we as look forward we, uh, to that, and I'm sure between you and Kevin, we uh, <laughs> will build them all out of masonry too. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the um, the other thing that I it's important to highlight is you, you don't just build buildings. Um, masons do other things, and um, I do want to point out to our viewers that if they look around the town at um, all the beautiful new sidewalks that we have. The mayor had actually put in some money into each year's capital budget for the last few years to upgrade our sidewalks. And that's also part of Greenable Woodbridge because we need to have a walkable community. Mm -hmm. And we have lots of areas without sidewalks, which are starting in the sidewalks on pub by public space that are on our land anyways. So we have an agreement with the Masons to do that. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, again, I have to give credit to somebody else because okay. Kevin uh, Duncan and the mayor, certainly the mayor, um, um, played a huge role in putting that agreement together. And it is replacing the city sidewalks here. And it's been a model that we've used throughout the state. Um, the other one I can think off the top of my head when Senate President Sweeney was a freeholder in Gloucester County, we did it down there as well. Uh, but here in uh, Woodbridge, um, there's actually residents and they're working directly for the township. And uh, it's under the standards of our collective bargaining agreement. It's under the prevailing wage laws that match um, our collectively bargained rates. Um, so you, we spoke about the pride earlier. And it's mm -hmm. not only the pride in their craft, it's the pride in their community. Um, and it's an ability, it's an opportunity for city government um, to work with the community and put your constituents to work on your projects. And it, it's worked really well. I think we might be in third, maybe fourth year yes. of that. Um, and I know for our members, um, it, it's a great thing. They're working in their communities. Mm -hmm. They see the people they know and you know their neighbors and friends and relatives. And it's worked really well. And as I mentioned, it is a model that we're trying to duplicate throughout the state because I believe statistics would show that the municipality is saving money. We are saving money. And we also, we just don't have the manpower, or I don't Nor think do we have the skill. Them. Right. Nor do you need to have right. the manpower on the payroll, as we all know, the tax yep. burdens that mm -hmm. all municipalities are facing right now. Um, this is a way to help alleviate that a little bit. Yep. And uh, it's a good program. It's a great I, program. I salute know. the mayor for having the... Um, wherewithal to put something like this yeah, together. It's, it's been terrific. Yeah. And, you know, good. He's a it's big good supporter of unions. Um, you know, it, it's funny because I never thought I would say a sidewalk is beautiful. <laughs> but <laughs> really, the sidewalks that your guys and women put in are absolutely oh. magnificent. They, well, you know, a if, a lot for of my people viewers, if they want to go to Colonia on Inman Avenue outside of Evergreen, that's one of your sidewalks. And well, like all of our other crafts, concrete sometimes get overlooked because all we do is walk and drive on it. Right. You, know, you don't see a building of stone. You know, you see mm -hmm. that and it's impressive and brick arches and different types of construction. But, uh, you know, it, it's essential. Right. Our sidewalks are essential to a civilization yeah. anymore. So, um, yeah, we take our members, our cement finishers, take a lot of pride in the work they do as well. Yep, and you know, as we are moving toward a, a more sustainable community, and we were a suburb built around the cars, and now we're trying to encourage people, not just for green, but for their health, to walk more, and we're creating bike routes, but the sidewalks are just so important to what it is that we do. Yeah. So um, I, I just have to tell you that uh, we're thrilled with It's the been a great co collaboration, that's for sure. Yeah. So we have a few minutes left. Is there anything that we left out, any way you want to put a ribbon around this discussion and summarize everything? The only thing I would like to talk about, we, uh, organized labor and the building trades in particular are very involved in our communities as we've described here a couple times. But we're also very concerned about the safety of working people ours and all the working people in the building trades. Um, we believe our standards lifts all boats. Mm -hmm. um, we're not opposed to those that are non-union. We just believe that they, there's a standard that they need to raise to. Um, we're in difficult times as well. Uh, the competition is being driven further and further down um, to a standard that's 
not a livable wage. Mm -hmm. And we need to do things to protect against that. I spoke about 150 years. We have 150 years of collective bargaining um, that we're going to protect because it's for the betterment of everybody in all communities, union and non-union alike. And, and I just, I wish people, you know, would understand what we stand for and who we are and take the time to find out that, uh, you know, that um, I am lost it's for a word important. here. It, it's how it's, important. It's the important, role that important to understand yes. and, and for us to understand other people's points of view too so right. we can come to, uh, um, you know, a collaboration and make sure we can work together because working people need to be united, union and non-union alike, mm -hmm. not, yes. not pitted against one another. That's for sure. And I'm sure being on here today helped to educate some people that really weren't even aware. You know, they just hear unions and they have to be aware of the, the value that you play and you really do bring everybody else up. It's we not just about so. green building, green jobs, but it's about building up the yeah. whole entire co economy. The old movie stigma is gone. Yes. It's a new labor movement right. um, that uh, plays by the rules and, uh, and works hard for our members right. and our communities. But and I thank you for the opportunity yeah. to be here today. It's great. And, yeah. and I just, you know, just want to say that I, I've watched your members work, and they are hard workers, yeah. and they're good. Eight and for eight, we always say. <laughs> eight hours pay for eight hours work, and that's what we live by. Yep. So. Well, thank you so thank much you. for I appreciate being with time. us today. This was terrific. Yes, it was. Thank I appreciate you. the opportunity. And um, thank you for watching Greenable Woodbridge and being part of the excitement and part of the change.